representative of the EHR vendor community. I'll try not to take a defensive stance. And uh, I think the uh, part of my goal today is to talk about how to constructively engage with the EHR vendor, as well as um, describe some of the work that I think is representative of what, what can be done through the, e, the commercial EHR approach. I think the um, many of the initiatives described here have happened within a environment that deployment beyond those environments is not very feasible, whereas from the EHR vendor community, we have a very um, scalable platform to work from. So I'll just share some, um, some, some examples and some, some ways to approach constructive engagement with the EHR world. Um, I always debate whether to begin or end with this um, paper. So at CERN, we have a, a group of researchers who are working under contract with the CDC on HIV analysis. And we did a paper that um, should have probably been published in the informatics literature, but I think it's really representative of what happens when you don't have decision support. So uh, we've been capturing longitudinal data on HIV patients for about 12 years. At the beginning of the study, they had the foresight to include HIV genotype, medication orders, and lab results, as well as medic um, a variety of other clinical parameters. This gave us a resource to do a retrospective analysis to evaluate what happens when clinicians do have genotype information that should inform prescribing decisions. And in a nutshell, what we found was um, the examples in the bottom of this show that um, of the 10,000 patients evaluated, 441 had an HIV genotype that was resistant to a medication that the patient was being treated with. Well, you know, keep in mind that these reports are delivered as paper reports. They're read and then they're filed away. So this is an example of what happens with that. Uh, as Lena mentioned, the least common denominator is faxing a report. And so this is part of the, the cost of doing that. Um, but what we found was that um, 239 patients were receiving a contraindicated antiretroviral. More alarming was that six months later, they were still receiving a genotypically contraindicated antiretroviral. And then 59 patients were initiated on a contraindicated antiretroviral. So when you have paper-based documentation of genetic findings in the absence of discrete data and decision support, this is what happens. We showed that there's an actual clinical cost, so um, statistically significant differences in <coughs> viral load, and CD4 levels. 36% um, of the physicians surveyed um, it recognized that they had continued the prescribing in error. And so this is where decision support, discrete data, um, this was very influential to our thinking and our strategy in um, genomic information and to um, a similar extent in family history. Um, I want to have a, just be a very transparent, so in terms of engaging with an EHR vendor, there's, um, we have to set priorities within our organizations. And so some of the factors in our prioritization process include responding to market demand. So we'll allocate priority to capabilities that the market will fund. Meaningful use for all of the you know, ups and downs of meaningful use. 10 years ago when I started talking about genetic information in the EHRs, the question I always received was, that's great, but only 10% of organizations are using EHRs. Now that is no longer a question, and a big driver for that is meaningful use. And so, the, you know, slowly but surely, the fact that the process and the systems are changing is um, at least changing the discussion. We respond to client satisfaction and retention, protecting market share. We do some strategy and vision-related development. So will also allocate um, some prioritization to anticipating where the market is going. And I think in many ways that's where we're struggling between a grand scheme on family history versus the current implementation of family history. And then we'll do some sponsored innovation at the edge, and we'll also do some work for community goods. So for example, 2009 during the anticipated flu pandemic, we did an initiative at no cost to our client base where we connected 800 of our clients for flu surveillance, provided daily updates of lab tests, orders, medication orders, and provided those back on a daily turnaround to 
all of the 800 clients participating in that. So we'll do some, um, in order to prove new models, um, we'll do some work in that paradigm. So in the proven markets category, what we found 12 years ago is that it was our laboratory clients who were asking for support specific to genetic testing. So that's where we, that's where we focused and we began by um, providing and developing a module within the laboratory suite to support the molecular diagnostic workflow. Likewise for family history, um, I'll show you a little bit about how we um, respond to that through a very a table oriented documentation approach. So in the laboratory area, there was comments from the speaker from Duke about the need for discrete genetic data and I think um, part of our strategy has been to respond to the issue of Right now, the results are embedded as text in a pathology report. So we've taken a discrete genetic data capture strategy, and so um, that provides data that's readily accessible from both the analytics and decision support perspective. Um, this is compatible within an HL7 2.x environment, so nothing magical needs to happen to transmit these genetic test results. Um, this is just showing how with cytogenetics we take a very ugly text blob and parse it into machine readable um, concepts that can be then consumed for analytics and decision support. For family history, I think it's per important to look specifically at the requirements, which are to document um, conditions by family members using SNOMED or the HL7 pedigree um, format, and that unknown is an allowed entry. So as Mark said, these are the requirements. They probably don't lead to the desired results. Um, within the Cerner system for meaningful use, we had just developed a tabular family history documentation approach that looks similar to the, the view that Mark shared from Intermountain. And so the users can document and associate a family member's um, history to a SNOMED code, and that fulfills the meaningful use requirements. We actually were already compliant with the meaningful use um, requirements. So my encouragement to those of you involved in the policy, if you want more, make sure that um, in the next iterations that there's more specific requirements. Um, we'd love to be driven to the, the, the grander uh, pedigree views and things like that. Um, so. Um, that we'd love on the we'd love to be driven towards that or yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, I, I'll show you some work that we've started that that kind of um, validates that. Um, likewise, there's been talk about how expensive and difficult it is to do decision support. A configurable rules engine, which is common in most commercial EHR systems, can be utilized to deliver pharmacogenetic decision support if you have the discrete results. So St. Jude um, Children's Hospital in, in Tennessee is using their system to validate mercaptopurine orders against discrete genetic test results and invoke one of those dreaded pop-up alerts um, to encourage the prescriber to review the dosing. So it can be done using a configurable real rules engine. And then with respect to potential markets, the sophisticated family history documentation in the EHR and in connection with the PHR, we have done some um, work to build out more of a patient portal PHR approach. And so these screenshots are from real code. It's not yet general availability, but we recognize that that model is a more effective model for, um, for who should be entering um, family history data. And then finally, we also recognize that um, DNA sequence management is an integral and important part of where the market's going. Where, as Elaine shared, most of her examples um, of things that they're working through are related to how to deal with diagnostic sequencing results. Um, I participated in a paper that um, describes a general strategy that we advocate, and that is um, storing the raw sequence results externalized from the EHR and as was as is being done at Vanderbilt, only pulling the interpreted and validated results into the EHR for um, use and decision support, but that that approach can be um, 
continuous in a very much in a cyclical basis. So in summary, I, um, I think EHR vendors are responding to the market demand. I think part of the, um, my observation through 12 plus years is that um, outside of this community, the, the wider clinical community is still intimidated by um, using genetic information and providing care. And so we still need to keep working on the adoption of, of um, using genetic information to support care. And um, with that, I'll stop and allow our next speaker.